Welcome to GMP The Great, Glorious, and Glamorous, aka The Going North Podcast, where authors from around the world help you realize that success is tangible. You'll leave with at least one new piece of inspiration or information to help you keep going north. Now let's get on with the show. And today on the Highlight Reel Builder for Authors, known as GMP, the great, glorious, and glamorous, the Going North Podcast, we got a returning guest, baby, that's right, from the wonderful, wonderful, super special, awesome, best-selling book, Mayhem to Miracles, y'all, M2M, that's right, M&Ms, but without the chocolate, well, no, well, then again, it, it's me talking about, so I guess it kind of is chocolate, and then, you know, different shades may call it white chocolate but that was that's beside the point though today's guest in particular <laughs> is a returning guest from last year she's back and better than ever and not better than ever so let's just give you a short little reminder of what this super special awesome lady does she's a shamanic practitioner of the rio napo nilliage in peru and she's also a certified trauma therapist with a private practice in southern cali y'all so that's right, all the sun on the bun, y'all. And she brings her extensive experience and knowledge into her work of helping others develop their own spiritual gifts. So let's give it up for the wonderful, jubilant, and luminous Judy Lemon. How you doing today, Judy? I'm doing good. How about yourself, Dom? I'm doing good with all the O's out of five Cheerios cereal boxes. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds like a lot of O's. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Because that's what you're bringing me today, because it's great you're back. That's right. You've been growing like a positive, giant oak tree, giving good shade to people in the summertime. Oh, I like that. I like that. Yes. Yes, I am back again with Mayhem to Miracles. It's been, it's been lovely being part of the authors group. You know, we had a, an authors meeting uh, or just a casual thing on Zoom, uh, was it yesterday? And it was lovely. You know, I, I really like that to see, you know, some of my fellow contributors to the books and each of us has our own story, uh, our own mayhem that we've passed through. And I think just being able to have community like this is just, I just really love it. Yeah, it's it's wonderful to be part of the Sacred Stories community. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's a Sacred Stories community, indeed. It's like a... <laughs> I don't know why as you're talking, this reminded me of the classic <laughs> tale of, what was it? I believe it was King Arthur, where the wonderful sword Excalibur is stuck in the rock. <laughs> oh, boy, don't get me going on that. I was going to I was a huge <laughs> King Arthur fan when I was younger, and that's what actually led me going to England. Um, I went there a couple of times before I moved there in the 80s, and I had to go down to Glastonbury and uh, go to Tintagel to see like all the places where King Arthur was supposed to have been. And just, yeah, I wanted that sword Excalibur. In fact, I think one of my early bands was called Excalibur. Yeah. All right. So maybe that's also why it popped in my head, because I was going to call the Sacred Stories community crew to like a group of Excalibur swords. It's just that they need the right person to pull them out of the darn stone and put their pen to paper like you have and dozens of others have. Sounds good to me, yes. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. And part of a rock band in past. I'm not even sure. Did we even cover that the last time? I don't even remember us covering the fact that you were actually going to be a, wanting to be a musician and you had some wonderful travels overseas in the wonderful land of England. Yeah. Um, my musical career started, uh, I, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles and there was a music teacher uh, and, and this was like a long time ago. So he got his students by going door to door, um, which you wouldn't see that nowadays. But, you know, I was one of those little kids that liked to get everything like, mom, mom, can I do acrobatic lessons? Mom, mom, can I play guitar? Mom, mom, can I do bat baton lessons? So, you know, I st I'm still like that. I still have like a bunch of plates in the air. So I started taking guitar lessons and then my sister started taking keyboard lessons. So our first band, I think was, 
I was about eight. Uh, we called ourselves the psychedelic screwdrivers after this multicolored screwdriver that we found in my dad's garage. I mean, you could imagine like the kind of stuff we wrote <laughs> store, uh, songs about, but that love never died. You know, I, I was in professional bands here in Southern California. And then my big dream was to go to London, uh, you know, partly to live the Arthurian legend and then partly to uh, work in the music scene there. And I did that for a while, you know, uh, I lived over there for nearly 20 years. Didn't quite get where I wanted to, but I'm grateful that I had the chance to try. Ah, uh, there we go, there we go. That's right, the psychedelic screwdrivers, y'all. That's right, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Sounds like some fun drinks for those who partake in that, too. <laughs> well, I know. Well, there was a band called the Psychedelic Furs, so why not the Psychedelic Screwdrivers? <laughs> That's right. We're better than the psychedelic hammers. We don't just nail everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's after you have a psychedelic <laughs> screwdriver. Then you get nailed. <laughs> uh, yeah, she nailed it too. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Well, speaking of nailing, it has been a whole freaking year since your first entry into the biz of immortality as part of a collaborative book effort. And with the uh, second visit to the podcast, I'm sure you've been doing a lot of growing and basically skill building. So is there any particular skill that you've been sharpening over the past 12 months or so that have benefited you in your writing journey? You know, it's been very helpful to see how an editor can improve one's work. You know, when I started with Sacred Stories, I started by sending them the full manuscript of my full length book. And the first thing Ariel said was, have you worked with a developmental editor? And I had not, you know, this was my first foray into putting something out. So she said, I think this would be a good idea. And um, so she connected me with Gina, who does a lot of the, the editing for like Crappy to Happy and Mayhem to Miracles and uh, the other anthologies. And seeing like what Gina does with my stories, um, I have another story that will come out in January for the Animals Anthology. Uh, it's called The Cat, the Coyote and the Crows. And she really worked her magic on that. So that's been very helpful to see, ah, this is what an editor can do. Like, I'm a pretty good writer. You know, I went to a Catholic school as a kid and we used to have to diagram sentences and spell correctly. And I know what kind of punctuation to use, but when somebody else comes in there and waves their mag magic editing wand, something happens. So what it's doing is it's helping me look at what I'm writing because I just finished a fourth story for their shamanism anthology. And I look at, this is what the editing did. Let me try to aim my writing a little bit more like that. I mean, I'm sure they will still edit it, but it's, it's helpful. So now I, I still need to go back and do the, the editing bits for Machete Will in my big book but now I have a better idea of what they're looking for. So that's been very helpful. Ah, uh, yeah. Definitely could say that again. Definitely could say that again. Like the whole iron sharpening iron thing. It's like you got this wonderful raw material. Heck, even going to a classic reference of the marble becoming a Michelangelo statue. It's like taking that raw marble and just shaping it up so that way you can get that full design and get that full statue where it needs to be. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's like when we were talking in the authors group, I'm kind of bemused by how this path has taken me because even though I started writing when I was seven years old, I don't know that I ever expected to have anything published. You know, I used to write stories about guinea pigs from other planets, you know, and my, my teachers would read it to the class and my classmates would tease me and like, ah, Judy's the guinea pig lady, ha ha ha, guinea pig lady. You know, but that was a long time ago. So to come full circle, and now I'm actually producing something and it, you kind of get on a roll. So now I'm starting to think like, what else can I do with this? Cause it's fun. Yeah, you know, you, right. 
you see your name on the front cover and it's like, ooh, you know, I got my name on the front cover, you know. So one day I want a book with just my name on the front cover. That's the next Sweet. goal. Sweet. So what's the <laughs> timeline? Are we looking at a timeline for that? Because if I'm not mistaken, um, I guess the raw content probably, what, 900 pages or <laughs> close to that? <laughs> I know. You know, I mean, to be honest, when um, I got it back with all the comments, I felt disheartened simply because of the volume of changes. Like the, the, the basic comment that I got was I need to present Machete Woman from the point of view of who I am now, like I am the teacher, I am the leader. Whereas when I wrote that book, I was still a student kind of bumbling through my apprenticeship and having these adventures. So what I need to do is restructure the book to kind of like put in some lessons from now. And that's actually harder for me than writing the book in the first place. So to be honest, I just left it up on a shelf and I think like, okay, I got to look at this book. And then I'd look at it and I'd look at the comments and think like, that's true. That's absolutely true. Oh, how am I going to do that? Uh, let's go see what there is in the kitchen to eat. You know, <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, and I'm very well aware because my community is waiting for that book. And I just, it's, it's one of these just excuses. It's like, you know, come on, let's get this out. So, but I feel a little bit more inclined to tackle it. It's a big project and, you know, it's just, what do they call that? Like finding excuses uh, for time frittering away. So it does. Yeah. It's, it's still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, yeah. Cause uh, that's right. Cause I'm considering myself part of the Judy Lemon waiting for Machete Woman book crew. That's right. I hold it in my hands to be like, yeah, selfie. Even though it's not exactly a selfie. <laughs> I think that's what I need because you know uh, I have a friend who's he's another Sacred Stories author and he he's acted as my mentor, and when he told me to write my story, he said I'll help you, and he kept checking in with me. You know, have you got the book written yet? You know, how's the writing going? Whatever, and that prompted me because it took me a year to write that book you know and now there's nobody behind me saying what are you doing with it have you taken it off the shelf yet what's taken you so long like there's people waiting for this like you know like many people sometimes you need that impetus like that person standing behind you like you know come on like pull your finger out like let's let's work on this <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, just to pull the finger out thing. It's like, oh yeah, she put herself in a Chinese finger trap so she wouldn't have to write it or touch it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I remember those things like, yeet, yeet, yeet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but hey, it's A-OK, -okay, it's A-OK, -okay, because it sounds like you're taking it brick by brick and piece by piece, especially since <laughs> congrats in advance for contributing to that wonderful book that's coming up, so my God goodness or at least um contribute to your story to the book because that actually ties in with one of your many talents i believe coyote training right yeah um you know in many native traditions for some reason coyote is said to be a trickster and sometimes when i tell my students to watch out because i'm a coyote teacher and i know i was talking about this with eileen sometimes people learn better not being taught directly. And I was one of those. Having been raised in a great educational system where we're taught, raise your hand in class, respond to the teacher, like be active. We think like, oh, that's a great way for our teacher to think we're a good student. But it doesn't work that way in shamanic training. The teachers trick you into getting out of your head and, you know, lots of times it involves just having your ego exploded and having them pull the rug out under your like self important traits. But then you get down the line a ways and you realize, oh, I see why they did that. Now I get it. Like, ah, six months later, I finally get the lesson. But yeah, for, for the story, 
the crows and the coyote and the cat were actually in my yard. Like the cat was the last of the cats that I brought back to Southern California from England. So she was already a little old girl. And then the crows, they're, they're in my yard because I feed them. Like I put bird food out every day. <laughs> and I just, I love them because they're, they're so intelligent. Like I have a macadamia nut tree and I'm watching them grab the macadamia nuts with their, their claws and like drill into it. Or if I put out some dry bread, uh, they take it over to the bird bath and dip it in the water so that it softens. So, and, and they also know that you're not a predator. So they know that I take care of them and I take care of like the wildlife in my yard. But when the, I had let my cat out into the yard, I didn't know that a coyote could get in my yard because that's just never happened before. But the crows knew they saw that thing in my yard and they just set up the biggest racket, you know, and tapping into it. I thought, this is unusual. I need to go out and see what it's like. So, you know, the gift that, that the, the crows gave me was, even though that was my cat's last day, I was still able to rescue her and take her to an animal hospital. And then, you know, we just, we did decide to, let her go because she did have a number of other health conditions but the crows gave me the gift of being able to be there while she knew hey my mom's there you know because i had brought three cats from england with me and i promised them that i will be there for your entire life and i will be there as you cross over the rainbow bridge and the crows gave me that gift because had they not made that noise I probably would have gone out and found my cat half eaten in the yard or completely gone. And that just would have been too traumatic. So I, I thank the crows and I put out food for them and make sure their bird bath is filled. Uh, that's what I'm talking about indeed. That's what I'm talking about indeed. That's right. She loves nature, y'all. She loves some crows, y'all. And in addition to some magical meows, y'all, I'm telling you, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Speaking of that, yeah, mine's trying to get food right now. <laughs> She's like, oh, yes, the sun's starting to go down. That means it's time for cat food. It's like, you, you can wait a little while. You're not going to starve. <laughs> well... Since you mentioned food, we're going to pop this question on you then a little early. So if this particular book, Mayhem to Miracles, was a food item, what would it be and why? Oh, boy. <laughs> that suddenly brought back a memory of the first layer cake that, that, that I ever made. <laughs> I don't know if it came out. Well, well, okay. I mean, if you want a long shot, I can't remember how old I was when I decided that I was going to learn to bake. But I didn't know that you were supposed to wait and let the layers cool first before you took them out of the pans. So there were two round layers and both of them, let's just say they didn't exit the pans like they should have. And then to make matters worse, <laughs> I didn't realize that you had to wait for the cake to cool down before you put the icing on. So I'm trying to put this buttercream icing on and bits of the cake are, it's already like the leaning tower of Pisa, but I'm trying to like put the cake, the icing on and bits of the cake are like dropping off. And then of course I was a kid and I think like, whoa, I want this to be green icing with like multicolored sprinkles. So, I mean, if you could just picture what this thing looked like. <laughs> I mean, it was literally mayhem, you know, and, and my mom, thank goodness, was just like standing by going, you know, oh, do you have to put the green food coloring in? It doesn't look very appetizing, but like, oh, yeah, I want a green cake. And what, it wasn't St. <laughs> Patrick's Day. Um, but I guess the miracle was that it actually tasted delicious. So if you didn't worry about the, the cake fail and just ate it, it was delicious. But needless to say, I like to look at those um, cake fail things that they have like on social media where they show like the perfect cake and they show like somebody's attempt at making it. And it's usually truly hideous. And it's like, 
I can identify with that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> That's not talking about a true mayhem to a miracle. That's not talking about indeed. <laughs> It's like, hey, the presentation is not an A plus, but hey, the taste is an A plus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we always look for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, even if they, it's not in a whole pot. It may be all over the ground. That's irrelevant. It's still there. <laughs> <laughs> well, some pot does come from the ground, so you're right. It's okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe that's why I was really a green cake. <laughs> that's right. I was going to say the look of the Irish, except it wasn't anywhere near St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> you know, kids and their sparkly sprinkles, that kind of a thing. I, just, I, I, I wish I would have taken a picture of that cake, though. I really do. It lives forever in my mind. <laughs> Ah, well, that's what I'm talking about today. So, my goodness, you got this story in Mayhem to Miracles, and it even features actually more about the fact that your husband was having an affair at the time and was even going through a period of, I guess, eternal adolescence, which really stuck out to me. So, mind going deeper into what folks can expect when they get to your chapter in this magical book? I, th I think. If I could sum it up, it was about we're not always aware that the universe does indeed have our back when we're getting the rug pulled out from underneath us. You know, I had moved to London to try to be a rock star and I ended up getting married and I had a very good life there for like the most part. I'm, I'm very grateful that I got to do it. I think as I started getting into spirituality, like when I learned to meditate and I started hearing the voice of my higher self, that's when I started realizing, gosh, maybe this path that I'm on isn't right, <clears throat> but I still kept trying. You know, I had my own recording studio and it was kind of like a moth hitting the flame. Like, okay, here's another rejection. Oh, look, it's another <laughs> rejection. I mean, and, you know, my husband was very traditional, too. I mean, he was a he was a good man. Um, I was a very different person all those years ago. And I think even though he knew what I was like when we got married, because uh, I told him I wanted to be a rock star. And then I was also working on a pilot's license. And, you know, I, you know, again, all of my different interests, where I think maybe he was looking for somebody who was more like, hey, let's sit on the couch and watch TV together or, you know, more of a traditional kind of a thing rather than like some wacky person who was trying to live a different life. But, you know, I, I never, like, like many people, when you find out that somebody that you trusted was cheating on you, it's devastating, you know, it really is very devastating. You know, it's been a long time, but I wish he would have just been honest, you know, like, hey, I'm feeling like this isn't working. I found somebody else rather than me having to find out. Like when you read the story in the book, I really did some amazing detective work to discover like what he was doing and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, basically it was just the end of my life there. Um, I could have stayed in London, but I was that was the beginning of my shamanic journey. I had discovered uh, this group there and I had gone to a camp on the introduction to shamanism and that process had started. So in tapping into my inner guidance, it was, no, you need to go back to your family in Southern California. There's other work for you to do. And again, that felt devastating because my big dream had been to go to London to make it big. Like I said, I got a chance to try, and I'm very grateful for that, but that wasn't what I was supposed to be doing with my life. So, you know, for, for people who would be reading my story, I would like to put out a message, like if you're going through what seems like hell, because that's what it seemed like at the time, and it went on and on and on, 
just hold your breath and dog paddle because you will get through it and at some point in the future you'll look back and you'll see how the universe lined everything up like dominoes like i have the benefit of hindsight now and i could see the whole thing but obviously when you're when you're in the pit you can't see out but eventually at some point you do start coming out of the pit it's like oh there is some sunlight and then you look back and you think like oh it would have been nice to stay there I, you know i loved living in europe it was wonderful um but it's not what i was supposed to be doing i had to i had to be beaten over the head it's like okay you're not listening to us wham we're pulling the plug on this life <laughs> boom you come back and you start following your path so thank you guys <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about indeed. That's right, Detective Judy, y'all. That's right, she's, she's a DJ, y'all, I'm telling you. That's right, spinning those records. That's right. That's right, indeed. It might not be Akashic Records, but they're definitely records, y'all. Records in terms of book records. <laughs> With the storage is right. <laughs> yeah, there were some good songs, and they're just sitting somewhere in a box. Uh, all right. I guess we can call the box Mike Tyson, maybe. That's right. (laughs) 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 You got me a little flummoxed on that one, Dom. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Just another one of my corn cobs where... <laughs> it ah. it makes sense, but doesn't make sense because you know oh. it's in a box. Mike Tyson boxer. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> a whole yeah, a couple minutes later, it's like oh yeah, okay. <laughs> we good. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So as you're on this interview tour, is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often? Ooh, boy, I probably have to take time to think about that one. Um, how about, you know, like what advice would you give to somebody? Let's, what, something about like giving, what advice would you give to somebody who is going through their own mayhem or, you know, whether they're in a crappy situation or chaotic or whatever, that kind of a thing. Ah, that's right. Indeed. That's right. Indeed. That's right, folks. That's right. Cause she's got some great advice y'all indeed to get through your mayhem to eventually get to your miracle. That's right. Like she said earlier, kind of hold your breath and doggy paddle y'all. That's right. And imagine yourself with bunny ears while you're doing it maybe (laughs) only if they're part of a six foot rabbit named Harvey (laughs) (laughs) I live in a world of the unseen so you know oftentimes we talk about children seeing spirits I know we're kind of going off the deep end here but you know I had a very, very rich imagination as a a child. I mean, I I would have had to to write about guinea pigs from another planet. But when we like some of my clients and parents will say like, well, what do I do if I have if my kid is talking to somebody in a room and I can't see them? You know, obviously you sort of assess it, but it depends on the age of the kid. You know, we say that children are still very much plugged into the spirit world. And they may very well be speaking to an ancestor who's come to say hi. So I would usually say, well, why not play along with it? You know, because if the child is in this wonderful imaginary scenario, don't say, there's nobody here. Who are you talking to? Stop that nonsense. You know, go fix dinner or something like that. Um, Or, you know, go wash your hands. It's like, oh, just be curious. Who are you talking to? What's their name? What are they wearing? You know, and 
it would be interesting to find out like who they're talking to because it may just be one of your relatives who's popped in for a visit or it could be a six foot rabbit named harvey <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm talking about indeed. That's what I'm talking about indeed. It's kind of interesting how just studies like that and moments like that are being acknowledged. Like, hey, you know what? The children are on to something. They haven't been to they has been they haven't been toxified yet by the world <laughs> in this current state. <laughs> that's right. You know, they, they still live in this the rich multi dimensional state. Whereas, you know, once you start going to school, that gets taken out of you you know like no the, the physical world is the only thing that's here you know don't be talking to these imaginary play playmates you know they're not real they don't exist but you know if you don't see through their eyes how do you know they don't exist i mean i i certainly live you know being a shamanic practitioner i live in a very rich world full of multi-dimensional beings and from my experience, they absolutely do exist. You know, I've seen them in many forms. So if somebody says to me, what kind of drugs are you on? What are you seeing? It's like, I can see them in the room right now and I'm completely sober. That's just part of my path and what I do. So they're not imaginary. They help me with my work. That's right indeed, that's right indeed. Right, indeed, because yes, with your work indeed, and folks have probably been lining up forever. They probably been lining up like the Israelites crossing the Red Sea for the stuff that you're doing, considering the past couple of years and everything that's going on. <laughs> it, there definitely has been an, an uptick. Yeah, you know, uh, particularly in like the trauma work, people with anxiety or depression. Uh, I do a lot of spiritual development work too, like helping people connect with their guides because uh, everybody has the ability to do these things. Some people don't want anything to do with it um, and that's fine, but other people don't believe in themselves, you know? So it's just like, you're not making this up. You know, we just, let's work on this a little bit more. But uh, yeah, with with the pandemic, it has definitely brought out a lot more emotion that needs to be dealt with. Emotion, people are feeling very insecure, not sure like what's going to happen. And, you know, there's not a one size fits all answer, but maybe to take a book out of Eckhart Tolle, like stay present, stay with the present moment, because in this moment, everything is perfectly fine. Don't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, we could have one of those big meteorites hit the earth, you know, or something, but we can't worry about that. But right now, everything's fine. Oh, yeah, that's right. Indeed. That's right. Indeed. So is there any two lessons that popped out from all the help you've been giving your clients? Have the clients been really Heck, I even helped you show more sides of yourself you may not have discovered if you haven't been doing this work. Um, I think the thing that's really important is for to reach out. One of the things, and, and I have applied this to myself, um, you know, from years past, when we're going through that pit, we think we're all alone. And it's true, there are some people who may not feel like they have a support system. The hardest thing is to not have somebody to talk to. You know, if you have friends or family that you can talk to, that's great. Some people don't have that. Um, so reach out to somebody like me, or just reach out to somebody. Um, you know, if somebody's really, really in the pitch, you know, call a helpline. But there is there is help. There is something out there. You know, I've been through those pits myself. You know, there's times in my distant past where I wanted to go to sleep and not wake up. I mean, thank goodness that wasn't in the cards yet. But, um, you know, 
there is a lot of that going on right now. And I know from my own experience, like if you go a few more steps and turn the corner, everything changes. And it's worth taking those few steps and realizing, oh, it's not as bad after all. Uh, that's what I'm talking about indeed. And definitely uh, happy that you didn't get into that state and stay into that state of wanting to go to sleep and not waking up indeed. Because there's so many more days ahead for you that are full of beautiful surprises. That's right. Beautiful yes. surprises indeed. That's right, indeed. So we're coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive for round two. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So you're basically called to give a keynote to the whole entire planet Earth and all 7 billion people for 90 minutes. And it's going to be your last speech on Earth. What would be the main message of that speech and what would the points of that message entail? Kindness is king. The world seems to have gotten so divisive or divisive, however you pronounce that. Um, it may be that the pandemic has inflamed a lot more emotions or political situations, but I'm not that old, but I grew up in a time where it seemed like people were more tolerant, um, you know, if I'm in a grocery store and I have to wait five or 10 minutes to pay for my groceries, is that bad, you know? But there's this, this impatient, like people running up on you, like driving, and then they get stuck at a red light. But it's mostly the, the way we deal with each other. You know, so many people are just looking for a bit of sweetness and humanity and even just like, in that same grocery store just to turn around and say hi i mean obviously you judge the situation but whenever when i go to a grocery store people always talk to me you know for some reason and maybe it's just because i seem open but you don't know what their history is maybe they're there trying to buy groceries for a sick relative or you know they're a caregiver or something like that and life is very difficult so i'd say you know when you start feeling those rage emotions take a really deep breath or maybe two or three and slow down and use that old thing treat others as you would want yourself to be treated because it doesn't make you more powerful to spew venom at somebody on the contrary, I think it shows a lack of control. So more control, just take a breath and just. OK, we good now. Yeah, it might drop, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Day the K.I.K., baby. Kindness is king. That's right. Put that crown on kindness, y'all. That's right. That's right, indeed. That's right. Take a deep breath. Breathe in some air. That's right. Breathe in some air. Give your body some extra air that it needs and so that way it can calm down. Just not too much air, though. Don't want to be an airhead, though. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes that's actually kind of fun, isn't it? <laughs> 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 When life gets too serious, it's all right to let in a bit of fresh air. <laughs> uh, well, that's a one-liner. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Hey. So, so for those who want to dive into the fresh air of you and keep up with all that you're doing and be on the lookout for not only co-author project number three that you're going to be part of with Sacred Stories Publishing, but also Machete Woman, where you're going to grace the cover and do a fabulous audio book. If you're reading it, what's the best way for folks to do so? You can find me at my website, judylemon.com. That's just J-U-D-Y-L-E-M-O-N.com. That's all the news that fits in print. <laughs> That's right. We're looking forward to the pretty good machete woman, y'all. That's right. She's going to have a big old knife. That's right. Or a sword. Or a snwife. 
You know, when I was in, when I'm in the jungle, I do carry a machete around. So it's not just, you know, a funny name, you, it, you know, it's an essential piece of equipment there. And there have been times when I hoist that machete and I'm Arthur pulling it out of the stone and I can almost see like, yes, there's lightning. I am the one, you know, and it's just a jungle machete. But, you know, like I said, I have an overactive imagination. Ah, uh, so does that mean you're going to release a special novel once you're done with the machete woman? Who knows? I, I just might. You know, like I said, I a year ago, I never expected my life would take this turn. So like I said, like I just kind of watch it and go, this is why we don't want to put too many boxes on what we think we expect from the universe. Because all of a sudden, this wonderful little gift will come in and say, why don't you go down that path and see what's going on there? And then all of a sudden, some more magic opens up. So who knows? Maybe maybe there will be some fiction in the future. Oh, that's what I'm talking about, folks. So that's right. So she decides to launch that novel after Machete Woman. Be on the lookout by heading over to JudyLemon.com. That's right. Subscribe to her mailing list in days. So that way you can keep up with all the updates and Indeed, y'all, I'm telling you, it's going to be great updates. I'm telling you, it's going to make your head spin and go up like a hot air balloon on the cover of Mayhem to Miracles, y'all. I'm telling you, you're going to be going up, up, and up, and then away, indeed. So, and speaking of away, any parting words before we close up shop, Judy? Well, it's been wonderful to see you and share some giggles with you again, Dom. <laughs> yeah. I think like I, I said before we started recording, I, I feel a, a bit more like an old hand. It's hard to believe that I felt nervous last year. <laughs> so like like the old ad used to say, you come a long way, baby. How's it going, my friend? I'm so glad you made it to the end. That shows that you are an uncommon finisher, and I am so grateful for you sharing your ears, your attention, and your time to this wonderful podcast to do something that will take yourself to the next level, and for everybody else involved in this wonderful program, share it with at least three people in your network so that way more folks can not only catch the fire that is on this podcast, but can also be inspired to be their best. 